we are going to have some fun. And the reason we are going to have some fun is because I have for you Apocalypse this Christmas. Have you ever received Apocalypse for Christmas? Uh, we are going to attempt something here. Uh, you've probably never heard a Christmas message from the book of Revelation before. And I have been entrenched in this book for the last year or two. Some of you guys realize that we have uh, recently gone through our Revelation course online. And we had like over 24 hours that it ended up being. I'm going to try my best to condense this down into a reasonable message. Obviously, we're not covering all of the book of Revelation. But we are going to talk about the woman giving birth to the man-child. Okay, look at this. Uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, literally his doulos. Paul calls himself a love slave, a doulos. The things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending. He sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John. We are told right in the very first verse, what we're dealing with here, that this is an unveiling of Jesus Christ. The eschaton, the end, is not a timeline. It is a person. Jesus Christ, he is the prototokos. He is the firstborn of all creation. That doesn't mean that Jesus was created. He stepped into creation. But this isn't like the start, like on a timeline. The word is arche. He is the source of all things. You see, the incarnation did not come out of creation. Although he appeared to step into creation at the middle of time, he did, he is the timeless one out of whom all things came into existence. You see, God created by choosing to become creation. Well, you put that in your pipe and smoke it for a minute there. <laughs> this is a much bigger story than we've been told. He is the RK. He is the source. He's the beginning and the end. He's the alpha and the omega. He is the end in the sense of the telos, the completion, the sum of all things. But more than that, the scripture says he is the eschaton. He is the end. Everything is summed up in Jesus. Amen? Now, um, I've got quite a bit here to run through. I'm going to do my best. But one thing about the book of Revelation, I'm sure, again, you've probably never heard it preached at Christmas, but a lot of us have zero interest in it because we grew up with these weird rapture fear, dispensationalist, antichrist, whatever, and we get the message of grace and we tend to put it on the shelf. But this is actually the most scriptural book in all of scripture. Out of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, John makes possibly more, but at least 518 callbacks to the Old Testament. And what he's doing is he's taking all these Old Testament prophets and he is summing them all up in Jesus. And quite often he is even subverting what is said and making it a lot more clear. Eugene Peterson says that much mischief has been done by reading the Revelation in isolation from its canonical context. Every line of the Revelation is mined out of the rich strata of Scripture laid down in the earlier ages. And one thing about when you begin to see what Revelation is really telling us about Jesus' victory, the cosmos, all of a sudden, you start to get an appetite for the Old Testament. again. Because, see, back in the day, they didn't call it the Old Testament. Jesus called it the Scriptures. The apostles called it the Scriptures. And Jesus tells us how to interpret the Scriptures. You see, there is only ultimately one literal interpretation of Scripture, and that is Jesus Christ. They testify of me. You study these words, as by these you gain eternal life. It all points to me. 
He came to tell us what Moses and the prophets and the law revealing himself in all these things, right? So John takes all of this and he's pulling from Ezekiel, from uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zephaniah. I mean, all, almost, almost every book is, is reflected in the book of Revelation, but we're told it's a book of symbols, and so we, we, we so often have taken everything literally in here. Like we know that the land of milk and honey is a metaphor, but we think the lake of fire is not. Yeah. I mean, is Jesus a farm animal? Is he an actual lamb with literally seven eyes and seven horns? It's kind of grotesque, okay? If you're going to take that literally. Okay? But see what John, you have to understand, John is standing in his gospel now, obviously, the ladies are there. The ladies are always ahead of things. But John is the only of the disciples who is standing at the foot of the cross. Everybody ran for their lives. And he sees Jesus lifted up on the cross. In Revelation, John is standing in the throne room, and he sees the Lamb ascend to the throne. Same John, two different books. Two different registers of the same thing. From earth, he sees Jesus ascend to the cross. From heaven, he sees what that cross is. He sees the lamb ascend to the throne. The cross is the throne. We are not dealing with a different Jesus in the book of Revelation. He is the same Jesus who rules with a rod of iron. The word is actually shepherds. The iron was driven through his hands, my friends. He rules with unconditional other giving love. That's how he conquers humanity, not by violence, not by coercion, not by force, not by nukes, not by Trump, not by Biden. See, we have a word for that in the book of Revelation. That's called the beast. Daniel tells us what the beast is. You have to understand the earliest Christians they would have understood this book a lot better than us today because the only scriptures they had were the Old Testament. They were familiar with all the symbology. We don't read the Old Testament because we don't even know the gospel. We're handed this transactional do-it-yourself nonsense, and so we're scared spitless of the Old Testament fiery prophets. But you see, the earliest Christians, they would have understood this, this language. They would have understood the symbolism. Daniel makes it clear, beasts are, are kingdoms. It's empire. In John's day, it's Rome. Rome had a flag. What was the flag of Rome? What was the animal on the Roman flag? E Eagle, right. What was the Roman on the, uh, the, the, uh, the animal on the Nazi flag? Rome was powerful. They could not burn up half the world with the press of one button. Empire's always been here. We've always been in the belly of the beast. But I don't want to just talk about the beast. I really want to talk about the whore today because it's Christmas. But John is subverting things, okay? See, John hears a lion. John wants to see inside this scroll that, that no one's worthy to open this scroll. Remember, John begins to cry. See, really, I want to see what's in the scroll. I mean, imagine it was like a lost season of Breaking Bad that was never released. And you're like, oh, I got it. This is a scroll. <laughs> And no one's worthy. And John begins to cry. And, it's, it's, uh, and the angel comes. He rebukes John. He's like, why are you crying? Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the scroll and loose its seven seals. And he looks. And what does he see? When he looks, he sees a slain lamb. Literally a little lambkin. As though it had been slain. Behold the power and majesty of God in this slain lamb. The wrath of God that you see all throughout the book of Revelation is the wrath of the lamb. That's like saying the wrath of the kitten. The lamb never becomes a beast. That's the false lamb that speaks like the beast. The kingdom doesn't move forward by empire, by sword, by violence, by coercion. That's not how our father 
That's not how his son and that's not how the spirit rolled. And so there's, a, there's this subversion in here, you see? The one who rules from the cross. The one, when John hears the militant language of the lion, looks and he sees the lamb. As a matter of fact, um, Jacob's prophecy over his son Judah, from you know, the lion of Judah, it says he, he crouches and rises up from his prey. He doesn't devour the prey. The, the devouring brothers were Simeon and Levi. Uh, they get rebuked because they love the sword. They love violence. But that's not, that's not how we serve. That's the chair in the corner over there, right? So anyway, I, I want to dive in here. Um, I mean, there's so many different w- ways we could go. I sat here for quite a while. That's why I have a computer. I'm preaching. I look like Rick Joyner preaching from a computer today. Because, I mean, how do you boil down 24 plus hours? I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to try. <laughs> but I, I do have a lot that I, I, I want to dive into. But just one other what, quick um, uh, subversion here. Uh, John sees the 144,000. Uh, but, but, or he hears the number, rather. Hears the number, just like he hears the lion, but when he looks, it's a lamb. He hears this number 144,000, but when he looks, it's an innumerable company. We're talking about something that the Lamb has accomplished on behalf of humanity. All the wrath sequences in here. You've got the the seals and the trumpets and the bowls. Well, first, let's start with the scroll. Would you like to know what's in the scroll? I have actually taken a peek into the scroll. I have tasted the scroll. It tastes like honey, but it makes the belly bitter because you might get rejected if you eat it and if you begin to speak it. But I have taken a peek into the scroll. And to put it a little simply, I like to call it the scroll. And the opening of the seals has to do with an unveiling of the gospel and the catastrophe that it brings to the old order of fallen Adam. The trumpets are the declaring of the gospel and the catastrophe that it brings on that old twisted order. The bowls, like drink offerings, bowls at the altar poured out, the bowls of plagues, destroying the captivity of sinful Egypt that was over our lives, a slave master. You see, you have to see all of these things in the light of Jesus Christ. These are symbols. These are signs. In fact, each of those three, and I didn't mean to go here. This is an extra 15 minutes for free. Those three Sets of seven, the seals, the trumpets, the bowls, I'm sure you're familiar with it. They're actually all telescoped within one another. You get to the sixth seal, and then all of a sudden the trumpets start. You get right towards the end of the trumpets, the bowls start. And in every one of those refrains, what do you get? It is finished. It is done. It is a recapitulation, a retelling of the same gospel story with spiritual imagery to catch our hard-headed attention and often from different registers, but it's not some timeline of events. We're talking about the eschaton himself. So I, I want to look at Revelation 12 for just a second. Uh, turn to somebody and say, Merry Christmas. Revelation 12, and I'm just going to bounce around. <clears throat> And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant. She was crying out in birth pains, the agony of giving birth. Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great dragon, with seven heads and ten horns, and on its head seven diadems. His tail swept a third of the stars from heaven and cast them to earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. 
she gave birth to a male child. One who is to rule, to shepherd all nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God, to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she's to be nourished for 1260 days. There's war in heaven. Michael and his angels fight against the dragon. The dragon, the angels fight back, but he's defeated. There's no longer any place for them in heaven. The dragon is cast down to the earth. The ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Jesus is ultimately the word of our testimony. And the word testimony, testify, witness, in fact, Witness is martyria, martyr. It is a martyr witness. Let me tell you something. You do not carry a cross to kill off your old sinful nature. That thing is dead and buried with Jesus. Read any one of Paul's letters, and it's going to put evangelicalism out of business. That old self has died with Christ. And guess what? You also absolutely do carry a cross. It is a cross of other giving love. It is laying ourselves down for the other. It is becoming cruciform, cross-shaped, because that is the shape of our God. Not self-masochism, but so much ecstatic, standing outside of yourself, love for others. That is what divinity looks like. Divinity is not just shooting lightning bolts out of your fingertips. Having 400 people fall over in the meeting at once. You could just work yourself up to that touch power. Now, God is love. Sandwiched between two chapters on spiritual gifts, you get the love chapter. This is the highest way. That is what divinization looks like. That is what deification looks like. That is what it means to be God's. Anyway. For they loved not their lives, even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath. Because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he'd been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she's to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from its mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. And those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus and he stood, or some translations, I stood on the sand of the sea. So this woman here, um, John calls this a great sign. And the dragon is coming to devour her. And we must understand that this woman figure is a very archetypal figure throughout the course of human history. And we're not going to get into all the weeds of every single symbol in here. But I do think it is important. Yes, it is Mary giving birth to Christ. Yes, it is Mother Church giving expression to Christ in the world. Galatians 4, Paul uses childbirth language of laboring to, to, uh, to labor to see Christ fully formed in us. And it is even here the, the earth in birth pangs, the earth acts in this whole scenario. In a sense, it's the earth soul, if that's not too granola sounding for you, okay? All of creation groans. We're talking about something that has affected all of creation. And yes, it is ultimately Israel, the womb of the incarnation from which Christ is eventually given birth 
to the world, in the world. Uh, there are allusions in this passage to Genesis 37. You remember Joseph's dream where the sun, moon, and 11 stars were bowing down to him. Uh, allusion to the 12 sons of Israel, the crown of the 12 stars. But there are archetypal images even in pagan culture in John's day. You had the constellation Virgo, the, the virgin, that had 12 stars, the sun passes through it, and at times the moon is underneath it. You had uh, in those cultures the Isis cult. You had the queen of heaven figure in the Greeks, the Romans, all these Semitic cultures. You had uh, Ishtar, Aphrodite, Venus, Isis giving birth to her son Horus. Uh, it's why a lot of your religious friends will not celebrate Christmas. They say it was a, it was a, a pagan innovation. See, it's not so much that Christians adopted this or stole it from pagans. The issue is that this is a very universal image that is now seen in the birth of Christ and in a sense, a consummation of all the world's mythologies, although not as direct, of course, as Israel. And so... The dragon is seeking to devour the child. You see this with Moses and Pharaoh, where the Hebrew children were slaughtered. You see this with Herod and the Christ child, where the Hebrew children were slaughtered. You see it with politics in America, where children are slaughtered. You see it all over the place. And then you have the flight into the desert, flight of Mary and Joseph into Egypt. I mean, there's so much in here. Um, you see it with Queen Athalia in 2 Kings 11, who kills all the children of the royal nursery. But Joash, the promised line, is stolen away. You could follow this all the way back to our primordial mother Eve. And the serpent, the dragon, is told, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Christ is ultimately the promised offspring who crushes the serpent's head. Uh, the serpent, even in that story, uh, is forced to go on his belly. It's like it's a, a picture of being cast down to the earth from heaven. And Eve gives birth to a third son, Seth, whose name means substitute, out of which the line of Christ comes. All throughout the prophets, Israel is depicted as the bride of God. It's from Israel that the man-child will come. You see her typified in the Shulamite, in the Song of Solomon. She foreshadows the church, the very bride of Christ. Now, there are multiple levels of analogy, my friends. She's the daughter of Jerusalem. She's the bride. Song of Solomon, my sister and bride. Don't get too excited. We're not in Appalachia here. It takes all of our human relationships to express them as metaphors, this divine union that is beyond even human articulation and yet has become human. Okay. So we're, we're bride, we're mother. Okay. Um, spouses. What we're dealing with here, though, the mother imagery connecting to the bride imagery. And so, um, You've got, you've got the bride. She goes to the wilderness. And I want to jump real quickly now to Revelation 17. <clears throat> then one of the angels, seven angels who had the seven bowls, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute, the whore of Babylon. I know many of you thought that um, the Catholic Church was the whore of Babylon. If you grew up in a nice Lutheran uh, church, trust me, I met many. Lutheran whores as well, okay? We'll get to this. <clears throat> I'll show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality. And with the wine whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name 
uh, of mystery, Babylon the great, mother of prostitutes and of the earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel rebukes him again. Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast and seven heads and ten horns that carry her. Okay, um, I know we think that the, you, you know, again, if you were Protestant, this was uh, the Rome or the Roman church, or maybe you thought it was Hollywood, Babylon was uh, Netflix, <laughs> women wearing yoga pants to church, spirit of Jezebel on them. But you remember what we just read back in, in chapter 12, we see the heavenly mother, the woman figure carried into the wilderness. And then John is carried into the wilderness. And what does he see? He sees the whore sitting on a scarlet beast, drunk with the blood of the martyrs and the saints. What we're dealing with here are not two female figures, but one and the same figure. Not two different women, but we're, now we are seeing humanity in the fallen register. She is no longer representing heavenly Sophia, heavenly wisdom. No longer is she representing the true self. And the prostitution that you have to understand here is not mere sexual immorality. We're talking about religious idolatry, being unfaithful to the bridegroom. She's lost her way. Now, I don't doubt in an allegorical way at the time of the reformers, the Roman church probably needed reform because it was acting the whore, right? But the seven, the seven hills that the whore is seated upon, people would take that to represent the seven hills of Rome back in that day and say, oh, let's see, this is a Roman church. But no, she is not the seven hills. She is not Rome. She's straddling Rome. Okay, she's, keep it clean here. She is inappropriately perched upon Rome. What did, what did, um, what did the religious Jews do in Jesus' day, who did they solicit to crucify the Messiah? They took him straight from Caiaphas, the high priest's house, over to Pontius Pilate's house. You read the book of Acts, the Jews would appeal to the Roman magistrates to slaughter the Christians, to persecute Paul, right? And turning to worldly violence to spill the blood of the saints. See, if you really go through what is Babylon here, it's really simple when you look just to the Old Testament. This is not Rome. This is Jerusalem in John's day. Now, don't get too excited and anti-Semitic in here today, okay? We're just going to, we're dealing with, we're dealing with fallen Judaism. A Jew's writing this about a Jewish Messiah, okay? You see, this is where the whore religion has sold out her own husband. This is Hosea. This is all the prophets. Okay, you've got all of these oracles against Babylon in Isaiah 13, Isaiah 14, Isaiah 21, Isaiah 47, Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 50, also against Tyre in Isaiah, in Ezekiel. is kind of all over the place, all right? What we're talking about here. See, we know Paul tells us that our, our mother is the, the Jerusalem from above, the new Jerusalem. But we're talking about Jerusalem in a fallen register, okay? We know that just a few years after this is written, that, that Jerusalem is going to fall to the Romans. And Jesus didn't want that. He wanted to gather her like a mother hen. He's weeping over Jerusalem. But they were holding on to their religious idolatry. It, it, it's whore religion. And although that was the type that John was talking about with the temple worship of his day, you have to understand that this applies to us very much so today because the church is working the corner all the time, turning to other lovers. Other lovers like your own human decision for Christ, your own human efforts to save yourself, to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, Big, polished, light shows and smoke machines. 
to have nothing to do with the simplicity of Christ in him crucified. See, this has to be Jerusalem because Rome never was in a covenantal relationship with God, but Jerusalem was. You see, Jerusalem was the unfaithful spouse. She was betrothed to God, and now she has turned to other lovers. And it's Jerusalem who is already described over and over and over as a whore in Scripture, all throughout the Old Testament. It's almost the theme of the prophets. The only two other cities that you get called a whore are Nineveh and Tyre. But these were not completely pagan cities. Do you remember the Ninevites had repented at the preaching of Jonah? But then they fell away again. Tyre came into this covenant where they were going to build the new temple, but then they reneged on the deal and they built a temple for Baal. See, this is a covenant-breaking thing that we're talking about. But see, right here, only Jerusalem fits the bill for the unfaithful city. Isaiah 121, how the great city has become a harlot. In Ezekiel 16, God sees her wallowing in her blood as an infant with an uncut cord. He raises her, he betrothes her, he beautifies her. And then what happens? She becomes a harlot. But do you also remember what happens there in Ezekiel in that chapter? Probably not, because we don't read the Old Testament. Judgment comes on her, and then she is restored. This is important. It's very pertinent. You see, there is hope and restoration for Babylon, but she will not be restored as Babylon. She will be restored as the new Jerusalem. Put your finger on that. Take a mid-service drink. Grab your neighbor by the ear. Wiggle that ear. Whisper into it. I know that's a lot of Bible, but this is really good for you. Take your vitamin C pill. Listen to Crowder. This is going to be good. Keep the scurvy away. This is going to help out. Just trust me. <clears throat> so Jesus is crucified with this twisted alliance of political and religious power. Violence and religion, hand in hand, two sides of the same coin. Okay, um, and that alliance has happened all throughout history. Okay, you whether the religious whore is spreading her legs for Congress or the Holy Roman Empire or Byzantium or Berlin or Moscow. The Jerusalem, this Jerusalem is in bed with the beast to persecute Christians. It is the Sanhedrin giving Jesus over to the Roman magistrates. And Jesus is weeping over Jerusalem. And the, the harlot is drunk with the blood of the prophets and the blood of the saints, the martyrs, the blood of righteous Abel up to Zechariah. Religion, this is what she does. She is intoxicated on this cup. But here's the funny thing. This cup is actually the Eucharistic cup. Because every time we come to the table, we are intoxicated not in a profane way, but in a holy way on the blood of the ultimate martyr. You see, this is looking at things in a different register. And when John sees what this is, if you see what she's clothed in, there are seven things John points out that she's clothed in. At the beginning of Revelation, Jesus uh, appears. John sees Jesus, and he points out seven features of Jesus. But her features are not actually features. It's just the stuff that she's covered in. Uh, the raiments, the gold, the gems. What he's looking at is temple imagery. These are temple raiments. The closest you see to uh, one of her actual features is she's got a cup in her hand, so you can probably almost see her hand. And then on her forehead, you can maybe almost see her forehead because it's written uh, uh, Babylon, mother of harlots, but that's where the high priest is supposed to have written holy to the Lord. 
What this is, it's, a, it's, a, it's an anti-temple. It's, it's, it's unveiling the temple uh, worship, the idolatry for what it is, and John marvels. Because suddenly, John, who is thoroughly enmeshed in temple culture, it's like the Wizard of Oz veil comes back, and he sees it as a house of demons, and he cannot believe what he's seeing. As Peter Lightheart says, John is like, is that Yuma? And so here we have this whore of Babylon which although it was Jerusalem, it was the temple in John's day, again, we have to read this allegorically as, as what we're dealing with throughout the church today. You see? It, and it's not just the, the legalism, but it, it's, it's everything that pulls away from a, a really Christological incarnational message here. Um, we're we're going to jump ahead a little bit. Jump to chapter 21. You need to understand this, again, is temple imagery. But Paul contrasts this mystery Babylon with a different mystery. Ephesians 4, 3.47, the mystery now revealed is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, the same body, same promises in Jesus. Ephesians 5, the great mystery, Christ and the church, the two become in one, the marriage feast of the new Eve, and the new Adam. So all of these beastly attempts as well to further the kingdom through the better light shows, through better legislation, whatever it may be, this is what we still struggle with. Just make people do the right thing. But just, you know, got that sword. Humanistic, faithless, systems of belief and there is a desert motif here before we jump into that the woman goes into the wilderness the whore is in the wilderness and there is something about wilderness that sort of lances the boil a little bit because what is evil sort of gets exposed in the desert now i don't have a desert theology i have a get out of the desert free ticket in jesus but you look at the shulamite in Song of Solomon, who is the bride figure. And she's tired, she's weary because she's been laboring under the sun and she's fruitless. There's this desert picture. She is fruitless because she's laboring under her brother's vision. She's laboring under the 40 steps to this and that, you know, of maybe brother, uh, pastor such and such. Striving away in these fields of religion. Drive, you know, you want to strive away in religion, God will allow you to dry right up and she has neglected her vineyard she's neglected that place of intimacy and fruitfulness with the Lord you guys remember when you first met Jesus and everything was just Jesus 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 you're walking on the street Jesus made that tree Jesus made that bubble gum Jesus made that Volvo everything was Jesus Jesus and of course you love Jesus so of course you volunteer for uh, stacking the chairs on Sunday morning and of course you love Jesus so you volunteer for Wednesday night church bingo and of course you love Jesus so you learn to play the oboe for the worship band and it is just and you do this and you do that and you do 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 and then eventually you look around wait a minute where did Jesus go and all you're left with is a bunch of doo doo right <laughs> But thankfully, we have a vineyard restoration program. Hosea 2.14. Now I will lead her. I will woo her. Think of Barry White's song. Come on, baby. Now I will lovingly deceive her into the desert. Dun, dun, dun. There I will speak tenderly to her. There I will restore her vineyards. There I will make the valley of Achor, the valley of trouble, a door of hope. Now we can learn a lot from the desert fathers. I don't think you need to go fast for 50 years and live a celibate life in order to become more holy. I mean, get married if you're not going to live a celibate life, but you know what I'm saying. But there is a an asceticism of the heart 
where we learn, as Matt was saying this morning, contemplation. Guys, with all the noise going on in the world today, with all the psychological clutter that's already bouncing around inside of you, we just live out of these reactive minds, out of our fears, out of our anxieties, and it drives 99% of our activity and what we do because we don't know how to settle down. And you can't force thoughts out. That, that's, not, that's not the Christian practice of contemplation because for starters, it's impossible. As Martin Laird says, your mind is like a cocktail party. It's always going on. The Buddhists call it the monkey mind. You can't force your thoughts to stop. But we can learn not to cling to them. We can learn to hold those thoughts open-handedly. It's like a sushi belt. You just let it drift by. And we learn to be still and know that he is God. And it is in that place that we get reordered. And if you want an ice cube's chance in hell of maintaining any mental sanity today, when the first thing we do is wake up and start scrolling through this thing and everybody's issues just start to dictate your day and drive your worldview. And you just become an internally fragmented mess. We must learn to let go. To return to silence. We've forgotten silence if we ever knew it. John of the Cross said silence is God's first language. Thomas Keating said silence is God's first language. Everything else is an inferior interpretation. Because he's beyond the limitations of our human mind. Every thought we have about him is limited and therefore an idol. And Jesus comes as the idol smasher. You see, you don't need to deconstruct too much because all you really need to do is actually start looking at Jesus and everything else falls away. Because everything else is our human attempt to climb to God. Jesus is God come down to us to reveal the Father. You cannot discover God. God is ineffable. If we're going to know God, it is because he is self-revealing. And he came and stepped into human skin. He stepped into your human skin. He stepped right inside of us. And that's where Paul says, somehow you know the truth. How do you know the truth? We don't have our doctrine in order. Come on, some of you guys think you're cats. I heard somebody meow yesterday. Right? It's not that we have our doctrine in order. But the fact is, when we hear the gospel, when we hear the gospel, it is like a tuning fork inside of us. Because Jesus is the logos. He is the principle of who God is. He is the word. Okay, He is the very blueprint of who God is. And we also are words, logoi of God. Because he spoke everything in existence. All to reflect the logos. You are words of God. But as Maximus the Confessor said, and Maximus the Confessor got his hand chopped off so he couldn't write anymore, got his, mouth, his tongue chopped out so he couldn't speak anymore. Uh, that's the kind of guy you want to listen to. And then after they killed him, they realized, oh, wait, he was right. And affirmed his doctrine com almost completely in a, in a church council. So anyways, Maximus says, we are, and the same with Scripture. This is not the Logos. This is, these are words of God that point to the Logos himself. And we are words of God. But the, to the degree that we're not point, pointing to Jesus, he says we're like words taken out of context. And that's surely true with the book of Revelation. I mean, you can build great end time cults from this book, right? So the bride... In Song of Solomon, the Shulamite, she's weary. She's in this desert. And you know what she calls herself? She, she says, she, says um, she calls herself a veiled woman, like a prostitute. But what does the shepherd immediately say to her? He calls her, oh, most beautiful of women. He's come to reveal to us our true selves. Because religion, like the temple whore, is all vestment and no substance. And that is what we call the false self. That is the old man. That is the thing that was crucified with Christ when you hung on his tree 2,000 years ago before you were born. Thomas Merton talks about this false self. 
He says, every one of us is shadowed by an illusory person, a false self. This is the person I want myself to be, but who cannot exist because God, because truth, light, knows nothing about him. And to be unknown to God is altogether too much privacy. My false and private self is the one who wants to exist outside the reach of God's will and God's love, outside of reality and outside of life. And such a self cannot help but be an illusion. We are not very good at recognizing illusions, especially the ones that we most cherish about ourselves. The ones we're born and raised with and which feed the roots of sin. For most of the people in the world, there's no greater subjective reality than this false self of theirs, which cannot exist. A life devoted to maintaining and expanding this false shelf, self, shelf, this shadow, is what we call a life of sin. All sin starts from the assumption that my false self, the self that exists only in my egocentric desires, is the fundamental reality of life around every which else in the universe is ordered. Thus, I use up my life in the desire for pleasures and the thirst for experiences, for power, honor, knowledge, feeling loved, in order to clothe this false self and construct its nothingness into something objectively real. And I wind experiences around myself and cover myself with pleasures and glory like bandages in order to make myself perceptible to myself and to the world. All vestment, no substance. As if I were an invisible body that could only become visible when something visible covers its surface. To be a saint means to be my true self. And therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is, in fact, the problem of finding out who I truly am and of discovering my true self, my essence or core. But there is no substance under the things with which I'm clothed. Hollow. My structure of pleasures and ambitions has no foundation. I am objectified in them. But they are all destined by their very contingency to be destroyed. And when they're gone, there will be nothing left to me but my own nakedness and emptiness and hollowness to tell me that I am all my own mistake. The secret of my identity is hidden in the love and mercy of God. Ultimately, the only way that I can be myself is to become identified with him in whom is hidden the reason and fulfillment of my existence. Therefore, there is only one problem on which my all my existence, my peace and my happiness to depend, to discover myself in discovering God. If I find him, I will find myself. And if I find my true self, I will find him. But although this looks simple, it is in reality immensely difficult. In fact, if I'm left to myself, it will be utterly impossible. For although I can know something of God's existence and nature by my own reason, there is no human and rational way at which I can arrive at that contact, that possession of him, which will be the discovery of who he really is and who I am in him. That is something no man can ever do alone, nor can all the men and all the created things in the universe help him in this work. The only one who can teach me to find God is God himself, i.e. Merry Christmas, i.e. the end of religion, the end of the Instagram self. Aren't you tired of that? It gets exhausting. We're talking about reality here. As a matter of fact, see, this is the depart from me, I never knew you of Jesus' statement. He doesn't know your illusory self. He only knows your true self. It's like, don't come in here with that nonsense. I know who you really are. 
That's the you that's written in the Lamb's book of life. The Instagram self is not written in that book. He gives you a white stone with a new name. Look at all the name changes in Scripture. Saul to Paul. Peter's name is changed. Abraham, Abram to Abraham. Sarai to Sarah. Jacob to Israel. It's the false self and the new self. This is Paul. And I'm sorry I've been in Paul for too long. This is Paul. The true you. The old is gone. The new has come. And if you overlay Paul on Revelation, well, guess what? When we get to chapter 21, the whore's burned up and the bride emerges. Same woman figure. We're not talking about different characters here. We're talking about the false register gone. When she is burned up, her smoke rises forever. You know what it is? It's a smoke of incense. This is temple imagery. As soon as they say she's burned up, everybody's saying, hallelujah, they're praising God. If that's your Aunt Thelma being roasted in hell and you're excited about it, you should go to hell, okay? It's the old self. So, John is, quote, in the spirit four times in the book of Revelation. And that's a good way to break up Revelation. But only two of those times does it say he is carried away in the spirit. Okay. One of those times he is carried away to the wilderness. And then he sees the whore. The other time in Revelation 21, when he is carried away in the spirit, he's taken to a high mountaintop a higher perspective, and he sees the bride, the new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven. Let me just read this. Then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, the true self, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance, like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, uh, the gates, uh, at the gates, 12 angels, 12 tribes of Israel inscribed on the gates, three on one side, three on one side, the four corners, just like they camped in Moses' uh, wilderness. They had the tribes placed exactly like that. It's a cross shape, by the way, Trinitarian gates. And the walls of the city had 12 foundations on them with the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Uh, he measures its width, length, and height, 12,000 stadia each. Um, that is the size, literally 1,300 square miles long and wide and high. That's the difference from New York City to New Orleans. That's how long the city is. That's the distance of London, England to Athens, Greece. It's the distance from almost exactly from Sydney, Australia to Auckland, New Zealand. I looked up on Google Maps. It has all of the gemstones, the same as the high priest wore in, in the, the were taken to the Holy of Holies. And I saw a note, uh, oh, in this, uh, the gates, the 12 gates. Um, were 12 pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. The street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Nothing hidden here. And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Now, if you followed the kings throughout the book of Revelation and the nations, they, uh, they hooked up with the beast, they uh, joined up with the whore, and then they fought the whore, they fight the lamb, they get devoured uh, by these weird creatures. They all get killed, and now we see them again coming into the city to eat the leaves of the tree of life for the healing of the nations. Kind of a restoration ending here. Kind of ends on a high note. You end with a garden. You end with a temple city. The temple was always a picture of Eden. You know that. The veil had cherubim on it, just like we're guarding Eden. The veil has been torn in Christ. But see, there's something more here than you going back into Eden 
something has transcended Eden. You are not just going into the Holy of Holies. You have become the Holy of Holies. In fact, creation has become the Holy of Holies. This 12,000 number, 144, the number of man, we're talking about creation. It says this is an angelic number. It's not a literal number. Okay, We're talking about us being his dwelling place and him being our dwelling place. This is affected in the incarnation. Those transparent streets of glass are us walking in his ways in perfect harmony. No separation between secular and sacred anymore. Zechariah prophesies about this day that even the cowbells hanging around the animals' necks will have inscribed holy unto the Lord the very thing that only the high priest was allowed to wear. And now they're on animal bells. It says the cooking pots will be as the very bowls used in the sacrifices in the altar. The, the pot that you're cooking chili in is holy. Everything is holy. The earth filled with his glory. No separation. No need of light, moon, sun. These are the first things created for the, the lamb is its light. You know, earlier during all the plagues and bowls and all this kind of stuff, you see the sun, you know, going dark and all this stuff. You don't need the sun. <laughs> all these things we idolatrously rely upon. All of a sudden, there's this stripping away and this realization of reality here. So much glory. Amen. Grab your neighbor in a headlock for just a second. Squeeze just a little oxygen out of their brain for a minute. If our eye is full of darkness, our body will be full of darkness. There is a place for exposing Babylon for what she is. But that's still a lower perspective to have. That's from the wilderness floor, from the valley. From the high place, from the mountaintop, John sees her as she truly is, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. She's been remade. If our eye is full of light, our whole body will be full of light. If we're only pointing out Babylon everywhere we go, if we're only pointing out darkness, how great is our darkness? Got those three or fingers pointing back at you and the thumb pointing right at God. It's a different perspective here. We should be seeing people as they truly are, even when they don't know who they are. We're calling out, giving birth to Christ in them. You see, his singular historic incarnation by this has come a cosmic incarnation. What we are working towards is the full manifestation and revelation of God being all in all. This is what we're talking about here. The gospel is not one flavor in the Baskin Robbins world shop of religion. Someone asked Karl Barth, he said, uh, does God reveal himself to other religions? And he said, God doesn't reveal himself by any religion, even the Christian religion. He has revealed himself in his son. God doesn't see Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus. He sees one sacrifice on behalf of the human race. Now, there is a place from coming, for coming out from them with Babylon. Come out from her, right? Okay, and if you're in, you know, you know some cultic thing that's abusive and demonic, and it's okay to come out. But we never come out from the body of Christ, from community here. He tells the Shulamite, uh, uh, go and, and shepherd your goats or, or take your goats, but lay the, rest your goats by the tents of the shepherds. There are good shepherds. Cyprian says, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this to, uh, so you'll go to Matt's church. But no, C Cyprian said, 
Uh, you cannot have God as father without the church as your mother. Now, he does not mean this in some transactional way where you have to go sit under a franchise name and warm a certain pew in a certain building. But the fact is, we are in relation with one another. And the new Jerusalem from above is our mother. And even the 12 gates of the city how, are made of pearl. You see, Jesus is the door, but we are also doors. Okay? Uh, it is through the preaching of the gospel, God uses us to draw people in. How can they hear if there's no preacher? And, and how is a pearl formed by an irritant? The, they knew that back then. Okay, it's, it's, it's cruciform love. It's laying our lives down that the world would see, would taste. It's the glory of Jesus becoming known by the agency of his bride. We are his glory. He is the light of the world. Now we are the light of the world. And look at this. Cornelius has an encounter with an angel. And the angel doesn't say, pray this prayer. You'll be fine. Keep doing what you're doing. He says, no, send a Joppa for uh, uh, the one Simon called Peter. He brings him into the church. Look at um, Paul. He gets knocked off his ass on the road to Damascus. Jesus didn't say, all right, took care of everything. Go uh, do something for me. He says, go down, Ananias, straight street. Paul gets baptized into the church. Okay. Now, again, I'm not plugging a building or whatever. I'm saying this is family. We, we can jump right from John's amazing vision of Jesus in the first chapter. And then we want to jump right over to the cosmic battles and the great victory and the high end note. But first, what do you have to go through? The seven letters to the churches, the messed up, weird, <laughs> problem riddled church. All right. It's no perfect church. If you found one, you'd mess it up. Again, I'm not plugging some particular franchise, but we are made to be relational. We are the mystical body of Christ. The church is our mother. We are giving birth to Christ in our own lives. This is every day is Christmas here, boys and girls. The, Chris, the never-ending Christmas. Just as Mary, just as Genesis 1, the Spirit hovers over the waters, and then the Word is spoken, and creation comes forth. In Luke chapter 1, the Spirit comes and ho hovers over Mary. Let the Word comes forth. Let it be according to thy Word. The Word is a seed. It comes in and all of creation is recreated. The new creation. But not just a new creation. It's the origin of the original creation. Because the incarnation, as I said, preceded creation, even though it hadn't happened in time and space yet. He is the, the Lamb the one to be flesh, the Logos to be flesh, long before he was the word become flesh. In some mystical way, you were associated with him from the foundation of the world. Now, what does that mean? I'm not particularly saying that you pre-existed, although you did in the heart and imagination of God. And if you follow a guy like Maximus the Confessor before he had his hand chopped off, he would say that like Melchizedek, who had no origin, we too will become unoriginate. That though we are creation, created, in some mystical way in Christ, we will become uncreated. Depends on how far we want to go with this. And when I say go far, I mean go back to what the early church fathers taught for the first 700 years. We don't even know what theosis means. We'll put the old theosis ad, Matt. Time for a commercial. Oh, theosis ad. God became man that man would become God. Irenaeus, Athanasius. You notice this new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem, unlike uh, johncrowder.net slash theosis web conference, February 17th through 18, commercial over. We'll talk about this stuff more. The new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, down from above. 
It is not built up from below. This is not what's called natural theology. With By my human brain, I am going to theologize and figure God out. This is not wisdom from below. This is not my human efforts reaching up to God like a Pentecostal preacher would have you do, right? And I say that because I grew up Pentecostal, and that's where I grew my love and affinity for religion. This is not the Tower of Babel, Babylon, reaching up. You are born from above. It is not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And what, Sergi uh, what Sergius Bokagov says is that, that we, what we're, what we're seeing here ultimately is the enchurchment of the cosmos. The cosmos coming to realize the truth of their origin and their inclusion. Because, see, it is one thing to believe that Jesus died as a man. It is a whole nother level to realize Jesus died as mankind. And what we're seeing is the divinization of this city. It's, it's the jasper and it's, it's the clear sardius. The city is the same color as Christ is in, in the, his initial vision of the throne room. Like a sardius stone and a jasper in appearance. That's the clear divinity. It's the red humanity. Adam is red. It's your d divinized humanity. You'll always be a human. If you don't like that, it's because you've only seen subheart humanity. There will always be a human being seated in the Trinity of God. Amen? And there you are woven into the humanity of Jesus Christ. You are breathing Christological air right now. Every breath you've ever breathed was Trinitarian air. There never has been separation. The only separation has been up here. The delusion of the illusory self that caused us to whore around and to get into a room where we were already seated. <laughs> Teresa of Avila said we are in a room filled with light, but we've had sand thrown in our eyes. You're already in. We're waking up. We're, we're wiping the, yeah, the boogers out of our eyes. Sin and this world. It's deluded world. So much glory, man. I apologize to anyone on the live stream who may have been offended at the word booger. I only meant I booger. I would never speak of a nose B word. This city that comes down is not built by human hands. This is not a human institution. Jesus said, I will build my church. Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. Peter was a little rock. He was the chip off the old block. The rock is the rock that came from Peter's mouth that became a mountain and filled the entire world. The kingdom of God. And that's why the 12 apostles are on the foundations of the city, whether we're actually standing on literal men. No, we're talking about the apostolic word. We aren't building upon our own experience, our own mystical encounters, as great as that may be. We better have room for mystical encounter in our theology, right? But we are ultimately on the rock of the apostolic message of Christ crucified, come from the Father, crucified, dead, buried, raised, ascended. This is the foundation that we rely upon because otherwise salvation ends up falling back upon our own laps and we're trying to experience our way into something where we're already at. It's union, amen? Just bite your neighbor's cheek off for just a second. <clears throat> so much stuff. John Bear says the church is the whole of humanity seen eschatologically from the end. Gregory of Nyssa says this, early church father, now the body of Christ, as I have often said, is the whole of humanity. Now the church we are a sacrament, a picture of Christ in the midst of this human world because they don't know who they are and we should be a light on the hill. 
And all the temple imagery that you see in Revelation in the Old Testament, in the outer court, it's lit by the sun and moon. There is no outer court anymore when John measures the temple in Revelation. Everybody's in. The middle inner court is lit by the lampstands. Anybody know who the lampstand is? The church. We are the light in this darkened world. It is, it is imperative that we, we declare the reality of this gospel out of love. We've got to open our mouths and try to declare the ineffable mystery. But once you get into the naos, once you get into the holy of holies, it's only lit up by the glory of God. And this temple doesn't need a sun, a moon, a lamp. It is lit up with the glory of God. Anybody lit up in here today? St. Hilary, not Hilary of Epstein Island, but Hilary of Poitiers. Hilary says, Christ has become the body of the whole of humanity. That through the body that he was kind enough to assume, the whole of humanity might be hidden in him. And he, by means of his unseen existence, could be reproduced in all. Did you know how pregnant you are? We were exalted because he humiliated himself. He who is God dwelt in the flesh, and we have been lifted up again from the flesh to God. <laughs> Skip. That said, that skip, that said, that skip, that skip, that should I just move to another page? Let's do that. Everybody say this if one died for all, all die. See, the beauty of the incarnation is this vicarious humanity of Christ. That by his singular incarnation, the mystery of his incarnation would, would extend to all things. Maximus was amazing at talking about this. United to him, but even more so identified with him in some mystical way. So much glory. And your faith isn't going to pull you into this. It's not about my faith. It's about his faithfulness. His repentance became my repentance. You say, well, what did Jesus need to repent for? Nothing you did. Therefore, he stepped in. You didn't, he didn't need baptism. You did. This is the vicarious humanity of Christ. He stepped into our broken humanity and bent our twisted human will back into alignment with the Father. You never even had a so-called free will, not in a libertarian way. It was a slave master to sin. You needed him to come and liberate, to free our will. He, uh, he enables the freed will response. When you see him without the blinders of sin and confusion and delusion and flesh and the devil and the world, and you see him as the beauty of all nations, the very thing that your inner logo he has crea was created to crave and desire, could you say no? You're free to say no. I highly doubt you will. And I do not stand alone in this. Clement of Alexandria, all men are Christ's, some by knowing him, the rest not yet. He is the Savior, not of some, and the rest not. For how is he Lord and Savior if he is not Lord and Savior of all? He is certainly the Savior of those who believe, while of those who do not believe, he is Lord until having become able to confess him, they obtain through him the benefit appropriate and suitable to their case. He is, he by the Father's will directs the salvation of all, for all things have been ordered both universally and in part by the Lord of the universe with a view to the salvation of the universe, but needful correction by the goodness of God and great overseeing judge by means of the attendant angels through various prior judgments, through the final judgment, compels even those who have become still more callous to repent. The question is, how does this judgment work? What is this fire that burns up Babylon? You see a sea of glass in the book of Revelation. And you also see a pool, a pond, a lake, a crucible of fire. There's a river of life which Ezekiel says brings life and even unsalts the salty sea, brings life, the river of life. 
a river of pleasure, the psalmist sees coming from the throne. Daniel sees it as a river of fire. Could be possibly be looking at the same thing in two different registers. As a matter of fact, I found a verse in the middle of Revelation that says the sea is mingled with fire. In the temple, there's a bronze laver before the altar throne. It's where the priests uh, were uh, tortured forever. No, I'm sorry. It's where they were cleansed so they could come in. Malachi calls this a refiner's fire. And in the same verse, a launderer's soap. Jesus, before he goes to the cross throne, takes out a basin, and he washes his disciples' feet. George MacDonald says the very fire of hell is the fire of love, but it is a love that will burn the evil out of you. I do not believe, he says, that mere punishment exists anywhere in the economy of the highest. I think mere punishment a human idea, not a divine one. But the consuming fire is more terrible than any punishment invented by riotous and cruel imagination. Punishment indeed it is, not mere punishment. A power of God for his creature. Love is God's being. Love is his creative energy. They are one. God's punishments are for the casting out of the sin that uncreates and for the recreating of the things his love made and sin has unmade. Get this one. Love loves unto purity. Love has ever in view the absolute loveliness of that which it beholds. Therefore, all that is not beautiful in the beloved, all that comes between and is not of love's kind must be destroyed, and our God is a consuming fire. Isaac of Nineveh, 7th century. If we said or thought that what concerns Gehenna is not in fact full of love and mixed with compassion, it would be an opinion tainted with blasphemy and abuse at our Lord God. If we even say that he will hand us to the fire in order to have us suffer, to torment us, and for every sort of evil, we ascribe to the divine nature hostility toward the rational creatures that God has created through grace. The same is the case if we state that God acts or thinks out of retribution, as though the Godhead wanted to avenge itself. Among all of God's actions, there is none that is not entirely dictated by mercy, love, and compassion. This is the beginning and the end of God's attitude toward us. You see, his love and his wrath are not two equal opposite aspects of his character. His wrath is a hot extension of his love. It is a big fat no against sinfulness itself because of what sinfulness does to molest and destroy us. His very children. His fire is his love. What I'm saying is God is hell. It's the same fire. Yeah. And for the saints, the Father said, it is our eternal delectability. Yeah. And as McDonald says, if it burns, walk towards it. And in my paraphrase of McDonald, you will end up high as a kite, my friend. <laughs> Origen said, of all the things Paul listed in Romans that cannot separate us from the love of God, how less can our free will separate us from the love of God? Yeah. Isaac says this, Isaac the Syrian, or Isaac of Nineveh, same guy. Just because terms like wrath, anger, hatred, and the rest are used of the Creator in the Bible, we should not imagine that He actually does anything in anger, hatred, or zeal. Many figurative terms, in errant evangelical world, many figurative terms are used of God in the Scriptures, terms which are far removed from His true nature. If we are going to be these literalists who take every single thing, I have, I've got probably 200 Song of Solomon commentaries. <laughs> and it just makes me laugh every time I open up one of these evangelical ones. The mystics see it. The, the mystics are the best with Song of Solomon. They get it, okay? 
But the evangelicals are doing backbends to try to make Song of Solomon literal. It's a literal lady, literally with Solomon. Her breasts are literally two fawns. Her eyes are literally doves. Her hair is literally like goats going down Mount Gilead. Literally, her neck is the Tower of David. <clears throat> Isaac says, God chastises with love, not for the sake of revenge, far be it, but seeking to make whole his image. And he does not harbor wrath until a time when correction is no longer possible. For he does not seek vengeance for himself. This is the aim of love. Love's chastisement is for correction. But it does not aim at retribution. The man who chooses to consider God as avenger, presuming that in this manner he bears witness to his justice, the same accuses him as being bereft of goodness. <clears throat> Far be it that vengeance could ever be found. And that fountain of love, an ocean brimming with goodness. St. Isaac says the idea that God torments people forever in anger is blasphemy. Yay. Where are we going here? <laughs> right I got revelation. We got hellfire. All on Christmas Eve. Let me give you a couple of verses and we'll land with this. And maybe there's still time to eat. <clears throat> I've got some uh, more, um, I don't know, sweeter meditations for you tomorrow when I speak. <laughs> Eusebius says, Christ will therefore subject to himself everything. And this saving subjection, it is right to regard as similar to that according which which the Son himself be subjected unto him who subjected himself to all things. We're following that. But after the close of everything, he will not dwell in a few, but in all those who are given worthy of the kingdom of heaven. So it shall come to pass all in all when he inhabits as his people all. St. Ambrose, this seemed good to God to manifest in Christ the mystery of his will, namely that he should be merciful to all who had strayed, whether in heaven or in earth, every being then in the heavens and on earth, while it learns the knowledge of Christ, is being restored to that which it, it was created. Paul in Colossians 1 and verse 16 says, Jesus Christ created all things. It doesn't take him four verses till he says that those same all things are restored in Christ. And this is the act of the incarnation. Ultimately, the incarnation is God's wrath against sin. He stepped in and ate it up. He ate up the muck into himself and he sucked it down the black hole of his broken servant body and spit you out the other side of the grave, a brand spanking new creation. His faithfulness. Not your repentance, his repentance. His circumcision was the circumcision of the entire world. His baptism is your baptism. His death is your death. His resurrection is your resurrection. His ascension was your ascension up to the Father. And now his co-seatedness is your co-seatedness right in the lap of the Father. And that is where you are. Amen? This is the importance of the incarnation. It's not just what he did, but it is who he is. Salvation is not a commodity that he hands out to some and withholds from others. That's Calvinism. Salvation is not a choice you make, therefore save yourself. That's charismatic Pentecostal Arminianism. Salvation is a person. And it's a person we participate in, but it's a person you can't get away from because he is the very ground of your existence. He's not just some observable object in the universe. Okay, in that sense, God doesn't exist. No, he is the ground of all existence. He is the one who holds you together. Everybody stand up for just a second. <clears throat> Gregory of Nyssa went... Every created being is at harmony with its Christ as Lord. Every creature shall have been made one body. Now the body of Christ, again, as I've often said, is the whole of humanity. Again, he writes, everything shall be subdued to Christ, and they shall be subdued by a full knowledge of him and by a remodeling. Now God will be all in all at the time of restitution. 
I'm not looking for a future reconciliation of all men. See, I believe it already happened 2,000 years ago. The, the issue is how does that play out? And we have this word of life to awaken people out of the hell they're already in. Yeah. Yeah. But at no point on any timeline do you see the good shepherd stop seeking after the lost sheep. All of us are wrapped up right in the baby Jesus. Just You're nestled into those swaddling clothes right now. So just put your hand on somebody's shoulder or somebody's head. I just want to pray for you. See, I understand we don't know how to deal with so many verses that have just been mangled and so much just speculation and made up nonsense over the years. But this story is about Jesus. It's about the one who has woven us into the Father's heart. The mystics of the church, one anonymous mystic, she said, it's like God took, it's like you and, and God are like two candles melted into one ball of wax. Yes, you're distinct, but you can't even tell where you end and he begins anymore. The bride and the bridegroom, the two become one. The city coming down from heaven, you were born from above. You had nothing to do with your natural birth. You didn't pick your mama. You didn't pick your daddy. You didn't help the doctor out with the forceps. You had nothing to do with your natural birth. You had nothing to do with your spiritual birth. You are born from above. Not of the will of husband. Not of the will of man. And Andrew said, you are born of Him. In, from the womb of Mary. As T.F. Torrance said, when someone asked him, how are you born again? When were you born again? He said, 2,000 years ago. And Jesus came out from the virgin womb and when He came out of the virgin tomb. His birth is the birth of the new world. New world order. <laughs> Lord, I just pray the light, the illuminating light of the Father seen in the prosopon, in the person, in the face of Jesus Christ. This, Paul says, is the knowledge of the glory of God. That this light would continue to illuminate. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're actually involved in this process. And we thank you that that fire we so thank you for this fire. If you are afraid of the fire, you don't understand the fire. Everyone will be salted with fire. This is the very fire of Pentecost. This is the fire of His presence. This is the fire of His love. And oh, that it were already kindled. This fire cast upon earth. We thank You for this refining fire. The dross, the wood, the hay, the stubble is burnt up that blindest that the gold, silver, and precious gems of the Imago Dei of the divine image would come forth. I thank you. Cyril or Cyprian, they sound similar. Said. Similes. <laughs> that just as the divinity did not burn up the fleshly body of Jesus Christ, see, so are we now burning bushes. Whether you know it or not, you are on fire. You're firebrands. Like Isaiah, your lips have been touched with the coal. We're fire breathers. So, Lord, I just thank you that the dragon has nothing on the torches coming out of our mouths. We have a gospel that burns up everything contrary to love, everything that stands in love's way, everything that is not beautiful in the beloved, a reframing, recreative word, a benediction word, a creative word that says, be ye holy even as you are holy. Even as our Father in heaven is holy. You have been made clean according to my word. Give him a shout tonight. I am done.
Amen, amen, and amen. Bless you all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and evermore shall be, world without end. Amen. We will see you at 7. Bless you guys.